Hi everyone and welcome to Squirrel Pie Productions. My name is Tommy. You can find me on Ravelry and Instagram as Dynamite Trujillo. Welcome to 100. Sorry, I did that wrong. Welcome to episode 100 of my podcast. Thank you so much for being here. That is very exciting. That is a nice round number and I'm very happy to be here at episode 100. I didn't do anything. I did not plan anything special. Kind of wish I would have, but I didn't so well. Anyhow, today is a beautiful and foggy and cold and cloudy and overcast and all of the synonyms for cloudiness. It's a Friday in June here on the Northern California coast where I am coming to you from. If you're a new viewer, welcome. And if you're a returning viewer, a big welcome back. Thank you so much for being here. You will find show notes in the description box below. That's where I will link to everything I talk about in today's episode. So. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Black Lives Matter movement and uh, the work that people are putting into uh, changing, trying to change and put an end to systemic racism and uh, talking about police brutality and the like. So um, that's happening right now and uh, I am in complete support of protesters and everybody putting in work to um, bring about change and to bring about awareness to people who really we should already be aware of this stuff. Um, and I know we in the knitting community are. Um, I'm pretty sure everybody watching this video isn't surprised by the fact that systemic racism exists and it's still something we deal with and it's something that many people in this country are oppressed by and many people benefit from. Um, so I kind of just wanted to say that as um, white people who already know this stuff, who, you know, about a year ago, was it about a year ago? Uh, many of us, um, had our awakening and did our research and learned a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, now we're being brought back to it. And if you look at yourself, if you're one of these people, one of these white people, one I'm one of them, <laughs> and you look at yourself now as opposed to that a year ago when you did all your research and you read all those books, uh, and you think about what you've been doing between now and then, um, it's kind of easy to see how easy it is to fall back into complacency. And I think my little message that I kind of want to contribute to the ether <laughs> is um, be aware of that easiness to slip into complacency. And even though you're a smart, intelligent person and you know what's going on and you're continuing to develop your knowledge, you're continuing to do your research, you're continuing to educate yourself, um, it's still really easy, especially when you're one of the people that does actually benefit from systemic races, racism, to in your day-to-day -day life kind of forget about it, to so push it to the back of your mind not even to push it to the back of your mind, just to let it flow to the back of your mind. Um, and that's how we become complacent and we don't do anything. And then something like this happens and you're like, oh yeah, and you feel kind of icky that it took something like this to put yourself back into it. So let's all try. <laughs> to avoid complacency and to keep it up here, you know what I mean? And I'm not the person to tell you how to go about doing what you need to do. Uh, I think the beautiful thing about the age that we live in is that we live in an age of, what do you call it? There's like a word for it, like free shareable knowledge. <laughs> we live in the age of the internet where everything is everywhere and for the good and for the bad and there's a lot of good on the internet uh 
the internet is our friend in figuring out how is best for us to contribute to change. If that makes sense. Um, I guess I'll throw this out there. There are really, there are a lot of really good lists that people have put together um, that pretty much are called something like anti-racism starter kits. People have put lists together of books, YouTube videos, all kinds of stuff. Um, so I will throw that out there. If you are at the level of still needing to be uh, educated and stuff, uh, it's a great place to start. It's a great place to continue educating yourself. And then beyond that, you know, we all have to figure out what we, what is good for ourselves to do. Anyhow, okay. I am going to move on to the rest of the podcast now, which feels a little weird. Honestly, knitting has felt a little unimportant to me right now. Um, but I have been doing it, not as much as normal, but um, I have had at least one project that has been really exciting to me lately. And I do have a couple of finished objects that I was working on um, last episode and that I have since finished. So I will talk about those now. I want to make sure I didn't forget to say anything I wanted to talk about. I think that's it. I think I'm going to move on. Okay. Okay, let's talk about my top now. Transitions are weird, right? Okay, so uh, I am wearing my Del Sol by Veronica Job. Also, I did not write up any show notes for this episode, which I feel like I did again recently, and that feels kind of weird. I just have a pile of stuff. So hopefully you don't mess anything up. So this is the Del Sol by Veronica Job. It is a top that I knit and I used this yarn. I used Yoth Yarns in the Best Friend base, which is a light fingering cotton wool blend. It's in the shiitake colorway, which is in this kind of like taupey brown kind of color. Um, this is what I have left. I used one skein. It's 550 yards a skein and I have like a ton left over which I'm bummed about. I just hate having leftover yarn. I don't know, it's like a thing. It's like a thing with me. But here it is, it's a cropped tank top. And it was a really neat pattern. The construction is pretty awesome. Check it out, I did the kitchen, no I didn't. I did the mattress stitch. In your face, mattress stitch. It's super sloppy, but whatever, it doesn't matter. So there it is from the front, side, and back. Can you tell I'm sunburned? If you're gonna be outside, if you're going to protests, if you're gardening, wear you some luck. Cause I did not. So, okay. The pattern was really awesome. As I talked about in my last episode, there were a couple parts of it that I felt like had typos in them. So it made it like just a little frustrating to get through, but it wasn't that big of a deal. Like I. I just kind of winged it during those parts and it's everything turned out totally fine. Um, so the construction elements that I think are neat include the fact that you start knitting on the um, sleeves, straps, and the straps are double knit. So they're the knit stitch on the right side and on the wrong side. Um, and that makes them really nice and thick and like they aren't gonna stretch endlessly, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, they, I think it makes them a little more structured. Uh, so that was really nice. Um, the construction of this, uh, gosh, gosh, I can't think of any words for anything ever. I don't know why you watch this. What is this called, scoop neck? That was really interesting and pretty fun. Um, all of the edges in this top are finished as you knit them with an I-cord edge, which I love. Uh, I love a built-in I-cord e I -cord edge like a lot. The back is a V-neck. The V-neck was super fun to do. It's also a reversible top, so you can wear the V-neck in the front or the back. I really like the V-neck in the back though. I think it looks really, really cool. I'm a big fan of V-neck necklines in the front overall. 
but in this top, I just love that v-neck in the back. I think it's really neat. Um, okay, so yeah, it's cropped. There's no waist shaping, so it's just knitting all the way down, which was super fun. You do knit it back and forth, and then at the end, you fold the whole thing in half and seam it up the sides. So they tell you to seam it uh, using the mattress stitch, and they have you seam it inside out, and then leave this little bit here as a split hem. Now, I do know how to do mattress stitch. I have done it before, more than a few times. Uh, I don't love the idea of seaming tops and sweaters and stuff. I just don't. I am one of those people. I got a thing. And so it's not something I just like have in my bank of things that I can just pull out and do. So I went to the old internet and I looked it up and I watched a couple little tutorials. I started out, I think, with Very Pink Knits, which is often my go-to for tutorials for things because her tutorials are uh, amazing. Um, but my problem is that I needed to seam this inside out so that I had an exposed seam. So I looked, and it didn't really say in the pattern, I just told you to do it. So I specifically looked up mattress stitching on the purl side, and I found a great tutorial. It is a little different, you know, how you pick up your stitches and stuff. Um, and I did it, and it's pretty sloppy. I feel like this part, I'm pretty sure you can, it's pretty obvious right here is like really sloppy. But I did it, and everything worked out evenly. I feel like that's one of my big beefs with the mattress stitch is that even if I mark my points, I always seem to, like, one side of the fabric is like this and the other one's like this, and then you have to, like, bunch it back up. And But this turned out great, and I'm super happy with it. I really, really like it. I have yet to find the perfect thing to wear with it or under it. Um, I am wearing it with a sewing finished object right now that I'll talk about later. And so far, this is kind of the best thing I found in my wardrobe that I can wear it with, but I still don't love it, like the whole look. So I still want to look more into sewing myself a dress, like a sleeveless dress to go under it. Also, since we're looking at this whole area, I am wearing my necklace that I will show you because it's awesome, made by Chevis from a Chevy Roll Stuff. She has an Etsy shop that uh, I think only gets updated like once in a while. Uh, I purchased this from her very first update uh, and I haven't looked, but there probably isn't anything in the shop right now. There might be, I don't know. I'll link her shop below and you can go check it out for yourself. But um, she does amazing solder work with knitted fabric and other fabrics like cross stitching fabrics too, I think. And um, she, uses glass to encase that fabric and then she solders around them and makes them into necklaces, stitch markers, progress keepers, all kinds of cool stuff. Her name is Chevis. She has a Chevy Roll Stuff podcast too and she is like the best, so. Okay. Is that it about this top? I think so. I uh, got this yarn at Stitches West this last year. Excuse me while I... Uh, in February. And, uh, yeah, I'm really happy to have used it. Okay, let's move on to my next finished object, which is my old-fashioned love socks. So, this is some Moonstone Dyeworks yarn, which is my hand-dyed yarn company. This is the very first self-striping yarn I ever dyed. It's on my BFL sock base. Uh, I've only done three runs of self-striping yarn so far, but I do plan to continue doing it for at least a little while. I don't know for how long. I don't know if it's a forever thing. I have no idea. I'm doing it right now because it's fun. <laughs> so, um, yeah, as soon as I dyed my very first self-striping, I cast it on. I called this colorway Old Fashioned Love after a John Fahey album. Here's the second sock. I did a 64 stitch German twisted cast on cast on. Two by two ribbing for the cuff and a heel flap and gusset and a wedge tail. And I love them very much. I use a size zero needle. <sighs> it's been a long time since I've finished a pair of socks, so this felt pretty good. 
Um, I definitely felt motivated to get these done because I was just so excited about the yarn. Uh, I do also have quite a bit of yarn left over. I think maybe 30 grams or so. Um, I use up more of my sock skeins now that I've gone down in needle size and up in stitch count. It uses a lot more yarn, makes a denser fabric, and I really like that. I used to use a size 1 and do 56 stitches, um, and I used to have like 45 grams of yarn left over when I was done with a pair of socks. Uh, so I'm really happy that this uses up more yarn. And I have designated the rest of the, that yarn to go into my crochet granny stripe blanket. Uh, which it's started in right now. I have worked on that in the past couple weeks. That's been crochet, like really mindless crochet is always kind of comfort work for me. Um, I didn't bring it over to show you though because it's not that much progress compared to the thing. But maybe next episode, if I put more work on it, I will show you my granny straight crochet blanket. I haven't blocked these, which is weird. I usually do. I usually do block my socks when I'm donating them. Not because I feel like structurally they need to be blocked or anything, just because I'm a sucker for like soaking and drying knitted fabric. I feel like uh, knitted fabric itself isn't really like finished until it's been gotten wet and dried, you know? <laughs> um, but weirdly, I never block these. I think that might be a first. But I can't wait to wear them. I think they are wonderful. They make me very happy. Oh, I have nowhere to throw anything. How about over here? Okay, I have two more projects that I've been working on and they are both for Lucy, who is my daughter. She is almost two years old and I it's been a while since I've knit her a pair of socks, so I decided to cast on a pair. So this is what I've got. Uh, this is some <sighs> scrap yarn from my scrap stash. It is Sweet Georgia yarn in the, like, tough sock base or something like that. Tough love sock, I think it's called. I don't know what the colorway is. Do I have a tag? I do have a tag. I have a tag. It's fine. It's fine. Okay. It is the... Strawberry season colorway. The July 2014 sock club colorway. Yep, I was in their sock club. So I'm doing a size one needle for whatever reason. I don't know. I cast on 48 stitches. I did the German twisted cast on a two by two cuff. And uh, I did a fish lips kiss heel, which I don't typically do for myself. I don't like the way it fits but I thought it might be good for her because I didn't feel like she needed anything so deep or structured as a heel flap and gusset. Um, and I didn't really want to do tube socks, so I thought I would just do something that I felt like was a little subtle and a little shallow maybe, and so I thought a fish ship's kiss heel would be great. Um, so I broke out my old pattern from Ravelry, <laughs> which I've had for like a million years, and I did it, and oh, fish lips kiss heels are so much fun. I love doing them, uh, but I never do them because they don't, I just don't like the way they feel on my foot. But hey, maybe if they're good for Lucy, I will keep doing them. Yeah. So I did the heel, I'm on the foot now, and I'm making them, I'm trying to make them like a little big. Uh, I don't know, It might. they might just fit her perfectly though. I have no idea. I haven't tried them on her yet. But that's where I'm at. That is the first one. Here is what I have still. And the Tough Love sock, by the way, since I'm here, is an 80-20 Superwash Merino Nylon. Uh, I do have some other yarn in here picked up for her next pair of socks. I was looking through my scrap bin for sock yarn for her and I came across this, which is Fiber Nymph Dye Works, it's self-striping, and I love it. I made a, sock, a pair of socks for myself with this a while ago. Um, and then Lucy came across this. It was in a mini skein, and she absolutely insisted that I wind it, like, right then. Like, she took the little tiny skein, and she walked over to my uh, Swift and Ball Winder, and she was like, oh, <laughs> like, do it. So I wound it up, and I was like, you know what, that would be perfect for heels. So this is going to be my next pair of socks for her. This, I believe, is Dire Bear Yarns, and that is that project. Ew. Cool. 
The next project is the one that I'm really, really excited about, and there's like an important piece to it that I forgot, so I'm gonna go get it. I'll be right back. <sighs> okay, so probably not surprisingly, I'm raising a child that really loves books. Probably most kids love books, right? I have no idea. Sorry, I don't know. I don't know anything about kids. <laughs> my kid is like my only experience with kids. She really likes books. She really, she has a lot of like favorite books, and one of the books that she really loves is this book. It's called Because I'm Your Dad. It's written by Amit Zappa, who I think is Frank Zappa's son. I can only assume. I'm pretty sure it's Frank Zappa's son. And it's about these two monsters. That's the daddy monster, and that's the baby monster. Um, and it's just, it's a really cute book about, like, the daddy monster and the kid monster doing things together. And it's, like, every page is, like, because I'm your dad. Like, we're going to do all this stuff together. And um, she really likes it, so... I decided to break out my Big Book of Knitted Monsters by Rebecca Danger and make her a daddy monster and baby monster. So I am doing, oh geez, did I lose the page? I'm doing Hugo the Couch Monster. I got to find him so that you can see him. Okay. So this is the monster I'm doing, and uh, the way this book is written is it gives you the pattern, just like a single pattern for all the different monsters, and um, to change the size of the monster, you use different weights of yarn, different needle sizes, different gauge, pretty much, um, determines your size. So I, so in her sample, this one is knit with bulky white yarn, this one's knit with worsted white yarn. So what I've decided to do is for the daddy monster that I'm making, I'm doing bulky weight, and then for the baby monster, I'm doing DK weight. So I went to the old internet and looked forever to try to find the perfect yarn. My criteria was color, first of all. I wanted a good green and a good lavender to try to match the color of these monsters. I also wanted them to be washable because I'm making stuffed animals for a toddler, so they needed to be, I wanted super wash wool is what I wanted. Um, and it took forever. I looked, I mean, I started out looking at local yarn shops, couldn't really find anything. Then I went to webs and knit picks. I couldn't find anything that I loved, but scouring deeper and deeper, I chose two yarns from knit picks. And when they came, I turned out I was really happy with them. So let me show you the yarns first, and then I'll show you my first monster. I got two skeins of each of these uh, yarns. So these are nitpicks. This is for the daddy monster and this is for the baby monster. <laughs> so this is Brava, which is acrylic. I don't love that. I just don't love using acrylic, uh, but it's turning out super fine and we are going with it. It's washable, it's soft, whatever. It's in the avocado colorway. It is kind of freaking perfect. By the way, I'm not doing the different, the two different colors of the monsters. That would be Intarsia in the round, and no thank you. So I got two skeins of this. It's bulky weight, and it is creating a big monster. Uh, and then for the baby monster, I got Swish DK, which is 100% Superwash Merino. And I, I really wish I could have gotten this in a bulky. I could have gotten this and like held it double. But the thing about Knit Picks is like their colors are kind of all over the place. Like you'll find a perfect color in one kind of yarn and they don't do that color in the other kind of yarn. And if you find the perfect color, what happened to me? In Okay, so see what I really wanted was Wool of the Andes Superwash Bulky for Daddy Monster. And they had a great color. I think it was Bamboo Heather. And they were out of it. But anyway, so I really like this. I'm excited about working with this one. It's in the, I don't know what colorway, oh, Sugar Plum. It's in the Sugar Plum colorway. So, right? That's pretty great, right? I'm pretty happy with it. So I started on the Daddy Monster. This is what I have left of the first ball. I really hope I have enough yarn. Uh, the sample in the book says that for the bulky one, she used uh, two skeins, 200 gram skeins of a bulky, so that's what I got. 
I don't know. I hope I don't run out of yarn. But here's the monsters. Here's the monsters legs. Oh my gosh. So you work it bottom up. You do a leg and then a leg and then you attach them. It's open on the underneath side right now. And then I'm just knitting up straight for a little while. Once I get probably to about here, I start decreasing and then its head is just kind of. Um, and then I'll do arms. I'm not sure how you do the arms, but whatever it calls for, I think I'm going to go possibly on my own and do like picked up arms where you pick up stitches from the already knit body and knit out. Um, I don't know. But, and then the only other thing that I'm going to do, well, so the thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add horns because these monsters <laughs> have horns, right? So they're like horns. And so I'm going to add that. I'm going to pick up stitches on the head on either side and just do two little like cones of knitting. And I have like cream colored yarn in my stash that I can use for that. I don't know what I'm gonna do about the faces. So she calls for safety eyes, which I don't have and I'm probably not gonna buy, and then like a felt mouth that you just glue on. And let me find a good picture in here that kind of shows you, they like make all kinds of different facial expressions. A lot of them are like open mouth smiles and stuff. And you, oh my goodness. The faces are definitely more complex than, I'm like, okay, well, here's one of the daddy monster with his mouth closed. So his eyes are like big round white eyes with black pupils. They have these little noses. And then I could just do that line for the mouth with little teeth coming out. But in a lot of the other pictures, their mouth is open like that. I'm going to do a closed mouth for each of them probably. I don't know how I'm going to do the faces. I have no idea. I have no idea. Maybe I'll buy like eyes and put them on or maybe I'll embroider eyes and I don't know yet. I haven't gotten that far. I'm a little worried that that's going to ruin it, <laughs> but it's going to be fine. I could just do the face like she has in the book, in the Knitted Monsters book, and it'll probably be fine. It doesn't have to be exact. But anyway, yeah, here I am. Here is where I am with my daddy monster. It is going to be huge. I like started knitting this and I was like, oh man, this is going to be really big. I think this is going to be as big as Lucy. I don't know. I think she could wear these as pants. Not really. My legs are too short. But anyway, that's where I am. So I just have this one started. Uh, once this is done, I will move on and do the baby monster. Um, and so this one I'm doing on a size nine needle. And then the DK I'm going to do probably on a size four, I'm thinking. We'll see. I've got my Coochie Kopi Progress Keeper on here, which I thought was really appropriate. This is by Charmed and Dangerous. And if you don't know, Coochie Kopi is a cartoon character from another cartoon. It's a cartoon within a cartoon, which are some of my favorite kinds of cartoons. It's from Bob's Burgers, which is a really good show. Okay, that's it. That's everything I've been working on. Woo! And that crochet blanket, which I'm not gonna show you. So I probably shouldn't have even told you about it. Oh well. What are you going to do? Okay, I am going to move on. Um, shop update. I'm skipping a shop update this week. Uh, and instead of listing anything uh, in the shop, I'm going to link down below to a website called BIPOC and Fiber. And it's where it's kind of a directory for um, Black, Indigenous, people of color in the making and like broader kind of general blogging sort of world, but pretty much in the creative community. Um, there's lots of yarn dyers and designers on that website. So if you're interested in purchasing some indie dyed yarn this week, I encourage you to check out that website. Sewing. I have some sewing. I did, it was my birthday last week on Sunday, May 31st was my birthday. And, uh, the week prior, I decided I wanted to do some birthday sewing to have kind of a birthday outfit, and uh, I made another gypsum skirt. Uh, gypsum is a skirt pattern by Sew so Liberated, and here is my second one. Uh, I was inspired to make this pattern initially 
uh, because Jillian of the Good Witch Knits podcast has made like a few at least, um, and kind of talks a lot about how great it is, and so I was inspired to make my own. Uh, I wore my first one on the podcast last week, I think, or maybe the week before, and uh, this is my second one. I am totally sold. I am making more. I've already purchased fabric to make more. So I'm going to try to clear some stuff on so I can stand on something so I can show you the skirt I made. Okay, here it is. So it's a uh, elastic waistband and it's got pockets. So the first one I made had like these big like uh, drapey pockets on the outside. This one has pockets like regular pockets on the inside. And uh, check it out. I freaking lined it. I'm so proud of myself. Uh, okay, that's it. That's what it looks like. Woo woo. Okay. I'm coming back down. So here's the waistband. It's a two inch elastic waistband. Oh, it's awesome. Okay. So I used this fabric that I've had in my stash for a pretty long time. Um, and it's really thin. I think it's gauze or something. I don't know. It's like super see through. Here. <laughs> Lifting my skirt up for you. It's really see-through. Um, and it's really thin. It's a really like open weave kind of fabric. Uh, it's really thin, uh, but it's still a little like stiff. It's cotton, I believe. And uh, so I wanted to use it, but I knew it wasn't going to be enough for a skirt on its own. Like you can wear a slip, but I, I don't know. I wanted it to have a lining. I thought if it had a lining, then it would be perfect. It would, for one, prevent it from being see-through. It would, for two, give it a layer of drapiness. Um, because I'm not a huge fan of the feeling of wearing a cotton that's not that drapey skirt or dress on your legs that, like, you know, as you're walking, it, like, <laughs> it doesn't act great. I don't know how to describe it. If you've made, you might know what I'm talking about. It doesn't matter. I don't like the way it feels uh, when you wear like not that drapey cotton as a skirt and you're walking. So I thought having a really drapey uh, lining would kind of do the trick and it did do the trick. It's so perfect. I love it so much. So the lining I used, I don't know what it is. I'm, I mean, it's totally synthetic. It's, it's like super slick and super drapey and like really, um, uh, has that like kind of cheap fake silk feel to it. <laughs> I bought it to be a skirt lining fabric back when I made my second, ooh, Um, does it matter? Does it matter this much? No, it doesn't matter. I'm going to put it at the bottom of the screen. So I made a couple of skirts years ago. Um, and the second one I made, I decided to line it. I didn't know how to line it. It didn't call for a lining and I messed it up really bad. It was terrible, but it is kind of a skirt that had a zipper up the back. So I feel like that made it a little more complicated. This was way easier to line. And I also, like I looked it up, I specifically first tried to look up like lining hacks for this specific pattern and I couldn't find anything. And then I just kind of looked up like how to line an elastic waistband skirt. And I got some like pretty good stuff on the internet but I mostly just kind of like winged it. What I ended up doing is I took the skirt pieces um, which in this version of this skirt is just the front and the back panel and uh, I cut out two extra front and back panels in the lining fabric and I sewed them together just like the regular panels without the pockets and then I sewed the lining to the skirt fabric uh, without the waistband just together like right sides together no right side of the lining to the wrong side of the skirt 
and I just sewed it together at the top like with a pretty wide stitch just like almost like basted it together I just sewed it together at the top and that was it I was like okay done and then I just treated it like the normal pattern so the uh that seam that sewed <laughs> I'm so bad at talking about sewing that seam that sewed the lining to the main fabric got um sewn up into the waistband and you can't even tell. It's like really awesome. I'm like pretty proud of it. Um, I'm actually gonna do this thing that's super weird and I'm gonna show you the inside of my skirt while I'm wearing it. So <laughs> that's what it looks like. I feel like that doesn't even look that good. I don't know why I'm showing it to you like this. But anyway, it's in there and it's in there securely and I feel like it's not sloppy looking and I'm really proud of it and I'm really happy with it. I'm glad I did it. So like I said, I've purchased fabric to make more of these skirts and more elastic. Uh, uh, one of those like Dritz packets of elastic uh, got me two skirts and like that much left so that I could do maybe like um, a skirt with an elastic back and a not elastic front, which so liberated has one of those. So yeah, I'm excited to make more of these. Okay, that's it. That's it for sewing. Um, I guess I'll do a moment on favorites. It was, like I said, my birthday last Sunday, and it was a pretty good day. It was really mellow. Uh, it was me, Colin, and Lucy home together, and um, it it was pretty difficult to feel celebratory uh, last Sunday when uh, the protests were really starting to get going and things were just... It just didn't feel right to be that woo about things. So it, we didn't do anything great. Um, we, what did we do? I don't even, I don't know what we did. We made breakfast, I think. I think he made me like a good breakfast. We went to the river. Uh, there's a lot of rivers in the ocean and stuff like really close to my house. So we went to um, the Mad River, a spot in Blue Lake, which is really close to my house. And uh, that was Lucy's first time going to the river. It was a really beautiful sunny day and um, she had a great time. A really, really good time. It's a really mellow river. And we just kind of brought a blanket and some snacks and sat out on the riverbank and she threw rocks into the water like forever. And there were dogs there and it was great. Um, and then we came home and had dinner. It was my first time getting takeout since uh, the whole shelter in place pandemic thing started and uh, it was pretty good it was okay I don't know one of my big like favorite things to do when it's my birthday is like all I want if I like nothing else happened I just want to go out to dinner on my birthday uh, so that couldn't happen uh, and I didn't some of the like like nicer better restaurants around where I am are doing takeout but I didn't want to do that I felt like part of the experience of going to those nicer places that I really love is actually being there. So I didn't want to do takeout from them. So we just did like uh, a pizza place kind <laughs> of takeout. I got fries and a burger and Colin got a Philly cheesesteak sandwich. Um, and I really love this takeout place. It's called the Arcata Pizza and Deli, uh, but the, it was terrible. Gosh, gosh, I had been craving fries. For two months I've been craving french fries and I finally got french fries and they were just like, and their fries are really awesome. I usually really love them, but they were very soggy. Like it's like they were only like par fried rather than, and they never did the second like crispy fry or something. But that didn't matter, it was fine. It was a dinner we didn't have to clean up after. And then um, kind of the big thing that I wanted to do for my birthday was watch a Muhammad Ali fight. Uh, I uh, am really into boxing. You probably don't know that, <laughs> but um, I really enjoy boxing. Um, and I could go into why and talk endlessly about it, but I don't think I will. I will a little bit. I love, to me, boxing is very similar to dancing. And I don't think that's uh, an uncommon sentiment, um, but I love the human body and I love movement and I love watching uh, people and their bodies in really uh, beautiful, structured, um, chore choreographed movement. But that's the nice thing about boxing is that it's not choreographed, but there are like moves and rules and like 
a box you stay in with what you're doing, but it's very interactive and spur of the moment. Um, I don't love watching fighting. Like, I don't like seeing violence, uh, but boxing is different to me. Anyway, I love boxing. And uh, I have never seen a Muhammad Ali fight, which I felt like was stupid. So <laughs> I had Colin um, choose a fight for me. I told him that's what I wanted to do for my birthday was watch one of his fights. And that I wanted him to do the research and pick a good one. So he picked um, a fight between Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier uh, in 1971. And it was great. It was just on YouTube. I'll link to it actually if you want to watch it. <laughs> uh, it was really fun to watch. I had such a good time. Um, I do regret that he chose his, it's a, it's a late career Muhammad Ali fight. So he's, both him and Joe Frazier are out of their normal style. It's, it was billed as the fight of the century, which is why Colin picked it. But it was because he was like trying to make a comeback or do like a chant, like a, what do you call it? When, People challenge each other at the end. I don't know, whatever. I also don't know anything about sports. Boxing is like the only sport I like. <laughs> um, so it, I really want to still see one of Muhammad Ali's like early fights where he floats like a butterfly and stings like a bee. So I'm gonna watch some more of those at some point coming up. Yeah, okay, that's it. I'm gonna leave you there. Thank you so much for joining me this week. Uh, I hope you are well. I hope you are safe. Um, I hope you're doing what you feel like you need to do uh, for and during all of the stuff happening in our world right now. Um, yeah. Let's read and partake in art together and uh, not be not be still, you know what I mean? We gotta move, we gotta, we gotta keep doing things. And, uh, okay, what's all my outro stuff? I hope you're having a great um, day. Uh, thank you, thank you so much to my Patreon supporters. Uh, your support really means the world to me. Uh, if you're interested, you can check it out, there's a link below, if not, it's fine totally fine. Um, <clears throat> have fun and stay awesome. <laughs> Bye.